I am very happy to be greeting you on behalf of the New Swan Shakespeare Center and the Department of English here at the University of California, Irvine, uh, to our much anticipated book launch for Elizabeth Allen's Uncertain Refuge. Uh, you're going to hear a lot more about Elizabeth's book in a few minutes from a very distinguished group of respondents. So let me just say, it was not easy getting Elizabeth to agree to have an event in honor of her extraordinary achievement in publishing this book. Even this morning, I could feel <laughs> her desire <laughs> to wiggle out of the spotlight. <laughs> So it has been a group effort uh, to give us this opportunity to honor our amazing mentor, administrator, scholar, teacher, and friend. I'd also like to recognize Sarah Allen, who is here today. She is Elizabeth's mother, and she, along with Ruby Danner, Elizabeth and Keith's daughter, the book is dedicated to Sarah. Our moderator today is Dee Van Smith professor of English at Princeton University. And Professor Smith is a highly accomplished scholar with diverse interests in medieval literature, post-colonialism, and ethnography. Thank you, uh, Julia, for organizing this and, and uh, you and Elizabeth, uh, Elizabeth especially, for, for writing this wonderful book, um, which I realized while I was preparing um, this morning was probably the last one of the last books I read before we went into quarantine. So um, in many ways, it introduced me to the idea of a lived sanctuary uh, in all of its complexity. Um, uh, there's the isolation, of course, but also it opened the way to forums like this, where we can interact in in ways that we hadn't been able to before from all across the country and across the world. Um, when I first read the book, and since then, I've been almost continually reminded of uh, a, a, a book um, which all of us know uh, and which looms over the field, um, Kantarovich's King's Two Bodies. Uh, like The King's Two Bodies, Elizabeth's is a book um, about political theology, uh, legal history, and literature, um, though more about literature than Kantarovich, uh, obviously, where he wrote about just Richard II. Elizabeth has written about Richard III, or Thomas More's Richard III, and, and many more texts. But this book, in many um, unusual ways, is a, is a kind of total phenomenon that doesn't just cross boundaries, it, it, it swamps them. So um, how to sum it up? Well, that's why we're here, and that's what the, uh, the four speakers we uh, will be hearing from um, will, will be doing. Uh, for, for me, though, um, one of my favorite phrases of, of Leonard Cohen um, sort of does it. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets out. Um, sanctuary is, is that crack. Uh, it's when things break down, when systems of justice and mercy uh, no longer work, um, that something else opens up. We see something beyond it. So sanctuary is when justice breaks down. It's not necessarily about its resolution. It's about what lies beyond. And um, one thing I love about this book is that it dwells in the middle. As Elizabeth says, it's particularly attentive to the middle where delay and mitigation open symbolic possibilities. The book begins with a small space of the you know, technical site of sanctuary before the altar. Um, but it moves through accounts of sanctuary and chronicles, the um, miracle of Cuthbert's stag, Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, the Ballad of Robin Hood and the Monk, Thomas More's Richard III, which I mentioned, Perkin Warbeck, and others. Um, and it ends with um, quite a, a moving and powerful coda, uh, which is a, a personal uh, autobiographical familial reflection on the role of the church uh, as, as a mobile space of refuge, in the era of 1954 to 1968, uh, civil rights, the civil rights movement, moving into the contemporary role of sanctuary cities, uh, the church and other spaces as potential sanctuaries in an era of um, increasingly vocal and obvious anti-immigration movements and white supremacy. 
So what, what seems at first to be just a crack in the order of things turns out to be the extraordinary condensed site of a host of social, legal, and intellectual practices. What Alan describes throughout and demonstrates are, in fact, symbolic practices, habitual crime, punishment, and penance, mercy, hospitality, and the king's peace, sacrilege, breach, and sacrifice, desperation, and exile. All of those things, as she beautifully and generatively demonstrates, give rise to literature. So our first panelist fortuitously will be speaking about law and literature. Uh, our, our first speaker is Jennifer Yonner, who's a professor of English at Caltech, who um, has two books that have come out um, recently in 2019, Literature and Law in the Era of Magna Carta from Oxford, and uh, a volume edited with Emily Steiner and Elizabeth Tyler, Historical Writing in Britain and Ireland, 500 to 1550, and uh, a second book on the way, Arts of Conjecture, Literary and Experimental Method, 1250 to 1500. So over to Jennifer. Thank you so much, Vance, for that introduction. Um, and first, I'll say congratulations to Elizabeth. Um, for an extraordinary book. And I think for those of us who have been lucky to be thinking with you along the road to it, it's just such a, an, as Van says, an unbelievable achievement. So um, it's, um, it's a bit um, overwhelming to try and, you know, sort of pick out one thread of conversation to start with, because it really is such a rich um, body of material that Elizabeth has drawn together in this book. Um, it's like all of my favorite scholarship um, in that its attunement to the complexity of the past has me listening in different ways to the present. Um, through Sanctuary, Elizabeth invites us to partake in the grace of suspended judgment. And here I'm paraphrasing um, some of my favorite of Elizabeth's own words to find those parcels of time and space where we might plan our work within, against, before, um, what Vance has, um, you know, evoked as, as broken justice, broken justice systems. Elizabeth describes medieval sanctuary as a configuration at once spatial, so the place of sanctuary, temporal, the time of sanctuary, uh, standardized to 40 days or a quarantine, and juridical, the grant of sanctuary. I learned in this book to understand sanctuary is fundamentally connected with the authority of royal government. Governance. So I think um, my intuition, and um, she talks about this in the, in the introduction, is to associate it with the space of the church and hence the privileges of the church. Um, but Uncertain Refuge teaches us that it operated fundamentally as an extension of royal largesse. Through the act of suspending his own punishment, a king could paradoxically bolster his power, magnanimously allowing the accused the bare salvation of their lives. An act of, quote, disrupted prosecution and suspended judgment, she writes, sanctuary's outcome was by definition open-ended, designed to stave off closure, that is execution, by offering a new life to the fugitive. So the Derridian part of me, and there will always be a Derridian part of me, um, finds myself really drawn to this formulation. We see in Elizabeth's book, uh, sanctuary acting as surplus as the deferral that allows law to reclaim, retain its claim as logos, as law, precisely by performing its mercy. Sanctuary allowed both seekers and grantors, if I'm capturing this um, correctly, and I hope I am, to suspend the time of reckoning by staking a transformative claim on space. In the acts of occupying it and seeding it, these actors, whether it's the fugitive or the um, church or the king, remade social and political possibilities. So we find this more metaphysical sense of sanctuary animating exquisite readings across the book. Um, I especially love in chapter one, Elizabeth's reading of the copious blood that pours forth from St. Cuthbert's mystical stag. It's leaking telltale heart-like out of the walls and beams of the house in which it's hidden. We can think of this as kind of violated sanctuary as accusation. Um, we see it again in chapter two in the artful canny fugitivity of the Baron Hudeberg. Um, here at Sanctuary is media strategy. And we see it in Elizabeth's gorgeous and utterly convincing reading of Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. Sanctuary as metonym for, quote, the as yet unfinished errors and conflicts of life in this world. 
One of the vital con contributions of this book to law and literature conversations, I think, is the subtlety it brings to the mesh of competing jurisdictional and rhetorical interests involved in the recognition and resolution of sanctuary cases. They are dramas, she demonstrates, and all the players had a mortal stake in their convincing performance. I could proliferate um, examples and favorite readings across the book, but I wanted to end um, on another vital component of her argument, which is that sanctuary is at its core about survival. Then as now, sanctuary follows from an existential question. How does one keep on living? Its answers are never final. Sanctuary is the way station, not the harbor. And its affordances, Elizabeth shows, are necessarily provisional, ad hoc, uncertain. But, and here I'll close with her own words, um, this is me like literally giving away the ending, um, quote, only with a clear and unsentimental vision of the capacities and limitations of a sanctuary as a legal practice can scholars do justice to the past. And only with that same clear historically conscious vision can post medieval people find ways to deploy this elastic form of action toward ethical and political good. So with Elizabeth's own words as my closing, um, I'll wrap up there. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, our uh, next speaker is Catherine um, Sanek, um, who <clears throat> is a professor of Jewish language and literature at the University of Michigan. Um, as you'll see when I uh, um, uh, cite her books, um, it's appropriate that she's gonna be talking about the theme of the sacred and secular in Elizabeth's book. Um, Sanak has written um, New Legends of England, Forms of Community in Late Medieval Saints' Lives from Penn in 2018, and Her Life Historical, Exemplarity in Female Saints' Lives in Late Medieval England, also from Penn in 2007, and is working on a new book, which sounds fascinating. Uh, my very brief summary of it is that it's about technologized and subjective experiences of time in dream, vision, lyric, and romance. So over to you. Thank you, Vance, um, and congratulations, um, Elizabeth. It is a great pleasure to have this opportunity um, to celebrate Elizabeth's brilliant book, Uncertain Refuge. Like her first book, False Fables and Exemplary Truth in Late Middle English Literature, this project teaches us how to read stories in a way that is equally attentive to their implications for human experience in the world and to the distinctive operations of narrative, the modes of meaning making available only in the realm of stories. Um, to me, what is uh, most remarkable about this book and about Elizabeth's scholarship as a whole is how it teaches us to recognize these forms of attention as mutual, even necessary to each other. She shows with amazing precision and generosity that stories matter to lived experience because they address and transform that experience through narrative's distinctive ability to manipulate time and space, symbol and significance. In this book, Elizabeth's rigorous readings of medieval stories of sanctuary that Jen has just beautifully outlined for us at once reveal the complex symbolic work they do and their capacity to surface or light up in Elizabeth's beautiful um, and Leonard Cohen-like phrase, um, a basic human demand for survival. A key thesis of the book is that Sanctuary recognizes this demand as valuable in and of itself. And I'm so glad to follow Jen because I feel like this is kind of where you landed um, in your comments. Although sanctuaries are sacred spaces, they privilege survival over salvation, earthly life over a spiritual afterlife. They are dedicated, that is, to the fugitive's secular existence. I use secular here in its primary medieval sense, one that Elizabeth also intends, where it refers to a category of time, the cyclum, chronological, historical, biographical time, the time of mutability and mortality. In the late Middle Ages, the term had already shifted in the direction of its modern sense, where it serves as the antithesis of religious, the secular as the not religious. But in the Middle Ages, secular refers to any person, practice, or institution devoted primarily to earthly experience. 
So there are secular priests, now an oxymoron, but in medieval Christianity, a reflection of a, tree, of a priest's um, pastoral activity in this world. This sense of secular means that it pairs with the sacred as a dyad rather than a binary, a two-part structure, not an opposition in any simple way. And to my mind, one of the signal contributions of uncertain refuge is to clarify this relationship. The secular can be defined against the sacred to be sure, but it can also host it as Elizabeth shows. In the stories explored here, sanctuary is sometimes represented as creating or marking a spatial difference between the sacred and the secular, but it is as often the highly charged zone where they intersect, the saturated center of a Venn diagram mapping their overlap. For this reason, the dyad of sacred and secular does not align neatly or stably with pairs that have a more ostensibly binary relation royal versus ecclesiastical authority, say, law or mercy, safety versus vulnerability, or the human versus the non-human. Instead, as Elizabeth shows, in the ambivalent space of sanctuary, such putative oppositions are liable to morph or merge, to be suspended or reassigned. Sanctuary, as Elizabeth explains, instantiates the complexity of relations between secular and sacred domains. This complexity exists in part because the secular is understood, as Vance uh, referred to in his opening comments, um, is understood in these stories as a time, quote, in the middle, a phrase Elizabeth borrows from Del Colve. That is the secular as a time when the eschatological end has not yet arrived and so does not yet confer ultimate meaning. Building on this, she shows that secular life is also in the middle in the sense of a structuring center. Sanctuary stories in her reading recognize the claims of human life, human mortality, human vulnerability as the warrant for the sacred, not its object. So the sacred matters because human living matters rather than understanding human life to matter because of its derivative or potential relation to the sacred. Sanctuary stories thus often locate the sacred as a bottom up rather than top down phenomenon, perhaps most strikingly in stories involving non-human animals, um, uh, including um, that magnificent stag that Jen referred to um, who is pursued during a hunt um, and becomes a kind of sanctuary seeker. In another miracle also discussed in um, the first chapter of Elizabeth's book, stolen livestock um, who are captive in a kind of anti-sanctuary of a thieves stronghold um, are under the care of St. Cuthbert who ensures their return to the local community devoted to him. Where in medieval culture, a stag readily figures royal authority, the barnyard animals have no such exalted symbolic value. Yet they too, as Elizabeth writes, figure sanctuary via, quote, the miraculously calm action of a wronged animal. In projecting a space that allows such care of the living, sanctuary stories mark secular life with absolute or categorical value usually accorded to the sacred. Instead of pilgrimage elsewhere to another place, sanctuary finds a place in this world to host its irrevocable value. Um, this is a beautiful as well as an important book. Thank you. <clears throat> um, our next speaker doesn't really need an introduction, but I'll give one anyway. Carmel Lockery is the Provost Professor of English at, and Affiliate Professor of Gender Studies at Indiana University. Um, who has numerous articles and numerous books. I'll run through the titles of the books very quickly. Her most recent is Nowhere in the Middle Ages. Uh, before that, Heterosyncrasies, Female Sexuality When Normal Wasn't, Covert Operations, The Medieval Uses of Secrecy, Constructing Medieval Sexual and Edited Volume, and Marjorie Kemp and the Translations of The Flash. Carmel will be speaking on the questions of hospitality and romance in the book. Thank you, Vance. Um, and I do want to congratulate Elizabeth on a fabulous book. I feel like I've been following this book 
<laughs> it's my third encounter with a book of one form or another. Elizabeth spoke at IU a couple of years back. And um, so, so it's wonderful to be here to, to talk about um, this uh, hospitality in relationship to refuge. Um, reading Uncertain Refuge, I was struck by her description of hospitality as the relative of, of its darker cousin, sacrifice, and as comprising a narrative of risk, one which is always cognizant of underlying violence. Although my task is to say something about hospitality and romance, I was reminded about how the genre of the fablio often deploys the idea of risky hospitality to serve as a ruse for sex. That is, hospitality is a narrative formula in which a host unwittingly gives sanctuary to the one who will, who will cuckold him. So even though the fablio might seem far removed here from its uses of hospitality and romance, I've been thinking about the two together in the case of the text Alan so brilliantly excavates, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Her analysis deftly exposes the, what she calls the destructive hospitality of kings in the poem with its investment in chivalric violence. My thoughts here are indebted to that analysis, even if I, I think I'm taking a little bit different direction. But what strikes me in this romance is that the Fablio notion of a kind of duplicitous um, hospitality, um, uh, um, it, it, that, that notion is something that we can use to explore um, Sir Gawain in the Green Knight as well. The risks of this duplicity, like the risk of the arrival of the stranger undenounced, are part of the vulnerability that hospitality poses to both parties involved for guest and for, for host. However, I'm wondering if Sir Gawain and the Green Knight isn't interested in something different, that is not so much hospitality's risks as its dysfunctions. And that may be just another form of risk, I'm not sure. I will briefly consider the two scenes of uh, hospitality, the Green Knight's eruption into the Christmas revels at Camelot and the second uh, scene, Gawain's reception at Bertillac's castle. Um, so first, the Green Knight's entry into the Christmas revels at Camelot, the precipitating impetus for his appearance, we're led to understand, is King Arthur's own youthful, if not childish, desire to hear or witness a marvel before he will eat. His motivation could hardly be construed as a hospitable one, and yet it does summon the stranger to his court. It's a kind of hospitality light, if you will, in which he creates hospitality as a function of his own honor. Arthur, Arthur refuses to eat or sit at the feast, it says in the text, as a matter of honor until he's heard a marvel or a suppliant appears at the court. One might argue that hospitality is itself a matter of a host's honor, but Arthur changes that hospitable motive into a game in which the sucker granted by that game becomes, well, let us say, irrelevant to the hospitality itself. The Green Knight's disruption of Arthur's feast and seeming answer to the king's call for a marvel likewise skews the hospitality relationship. First, he does not accept the king's, author, uh, the king's offer of hospitality. Instead, he rejects it in order to pose his challenge, which will end up sending Gawain in search of sanctuary. The predominant effective tenor of this scene, as so many have noted, is shame on Arthur's part in the face of the gentle mockery of the guest. The shaming of the host is important, I think, not just because it tends to expose the gap between the chivalric reputation of Camelot's knights and, rea and reality, but because it is fundamentally at odds with the gracious hospitality Arthur seems to proffer, as well as the humble acceptance one would expect of a supplicant even a green, rather puzzling one. The Green Knight's refusal to dismount is one clear rebuff against Arthur's hospitality. The other is his refusal to join in the feasting before he loses his head, of course. One might add to the dysfunction of this scene of hospitality, the Green Knight's own duplicity in his challenge. Given, the, given that Gawain and the court could have reasonably expected the challenge to end with Gawain's severing of the knight's head from his body. Although Arthur performs the letter, if not the spirit of hospitality, I think the second scene at Bertillac's castle represents a serious violation of both. First of all, there is no risk for the Lord and his court in admitting Gawain, whom they know he is no stranger, 
So the stakes of hospitality, uh, hospitality are nullified for them. The risk, one might assume, is all in the guest part here. Since Gawain doesn't know this community or its Lord, although its customs seem to be straight out of Camelot. It is the Lord's game of the exchange of gifts that introduces the element of duplicity that will nullify the governing understanding of hospitality, much as the stock Fablio situation does. While many readers have noted Gawain's predicament in the bedroom scenes of not violating his obligations to his host by sleeping with his wife, what is not so often noted is how the very testing of Gawain clearly instrumentalizes the obligations of hospitality in order to place Gawain in danger. All of the welcome of Bertilek's court, his returns from the hunt, and his concern for Gawain's upcoming encounter with the Green Knight are part of a larger stratagem to make Gawain vulnerable through the hospitality pact, while in fact lulling him into a danger he does not foresee. And finally, there is that queer skewing of the demands of the whole exchange of gifts game in the sense that if Gawain succumbs to the Lord's wife, then he must exchange that sex that he achieves with his host at the end of the day, a prospect that Carolyn Dinshaw explored once in the 1990s. The absurdity of this possibility must somehow carry implications for the poem's larger perspective on hospitality, I think. So what kind of hospitality is this, we might ask? A hospitality that is born of Arthur's boyish impulse or one that provides a cover for a life-threatening encounter? Neither of these seems particularly observant of the code of hospitality as I understand it. So I'm wondering if the, the, in this romance, we have a representative of the darker side of hospitality, one that serves ulterior ends than the guests' succor and sanctuary. The sacrifice that hospitality summons in this poem, as Alan has so deftly shown, is its own dark cousin of hospitality. The attenuated nature of the two forms of hospitality that structure the poem might provide a sense of urgency to its questioning of, of chivalric violence as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, our final speaker is Matthew Vernon who's um, an associate professor of English at UC Davis, who's um, innovative, uh, fascinating, and important um, um, book uh, came out in 2018, The Black Middle Ages, Race and the Construction of the Middle Ages. So uh, welcome, Matthew. Thank you very much for that introduction. And I wanted to express my thanks for having the chance to engage with uh, such a stimulating book. Uh, my eagerness to like, simply celebrate this work is only somewhat tempered by the lens through which I began to write my response. I began to write my uh, comments as, a, as the image of Haitian refugees being rounded up on, um, by men on horseback were splashed across the front page of every major newspaper. And this only sharpened the focus of why I think that Elizabeth Allen's work is so important. However, it also adds a melancholy note of reflection to what I have for you all today. Indeed, as I was reading the book, I was struck by its canny use of temporality. On one hand, it is a remarkable show of historical responsibility and restraint, showing great care to place everything in appropriate historical context. However, like all excellent books, Uncertain Refuge defies its temporal bonds. To quote a line that captures from the book that captures the temporal dynamism, Professor Allen writes, Uncertain Refuge emphasizes the middle of the story. What happens to the fugitive and the community while they're in a sacred space? The middle is where the sanctuary's outcomes are most uncertain, the place of possibility where the end remains open, the worst execution staved off by the alternative as yet undecided, a place where the fugitive might watch and wait, refuse to emerge, receive guests, hear rumors, fear breach. The compelling unruly middle becomes a potent site for imitating, initiating post-medieval moves and political action. In particular, I'm interested in to what extent this book prompts us to think of beyond the, the notion of sanctuary. When reflecting on the relationship between sanctuary, Black Lives Matter, and Black churches and the moving end to her study, Alan rightly notes the following. The contention of Black Lives Matter, of course, is precisely that Black people in America should be safe everywhere across spatial borders, but both inside and outside of their homes and neighborhoods and churches and communities. Huddling in churches in this light is a half measure bound up with the traditions that have repressed Black people since the days of slavery. 
Embedded within Uncertain Refuge's argument about sanctuary and its unique place with respect to spatial and temporal boundaries is a call to move forward, to imagine a world that is not premised on the temporary and precarious possibilities of sanctuary and hospitality that so frequently go hand in hand with sacrifice and guilt, and to instead conjure a more durable means of inclusion. I would venture to argue that her work points us towards what the Black British studies theorist and scholar Paul Gilroy described as conviviality. For Gilroy, that means creating a counter history to the ones that have developed around our pasts, a counter history that resists the scripts that threaten to trap us forever in moments of hiatus, wherein the person seeking sanctuary is always occupying a not quite space, a political and cultural in between space where certain bodies are eternally, eternally internal strangers, even when granted entrance into the country. And this is what struck me so powerfully about, uh, about reading Elizabeth's book while seeing those images of Haitian migrants. It's not, so, it's not striking because the images are new, but because they are so familiar, seemingly deliberately so, tapping into an iconography that puts the border situation into a different temporal frame, replaying the enduring performance of white power with a frighteningly familiar symbolic repertoire. And we seem to be bound up in a tug of war between state power to exclude and the state's power to make exceptions to that, to that, which seems to lead us down an unending but familiar path. But I don't want to end on that note. So I want to quickly express where I see hope in creating such a counter history, or as Elizabeth so beautifully puts it, we can see a stage for negotiation between the unexpected or idiosyncratic happenings and the conventional expectations for a cultural repertoire. And I hope that Elizabeth will forgive me for doing this, but I want to borrow her very carefully situated quote and take it wildly out of context. While reflecting on this idea about the unexpected and the conventional, I thought about the very curious new version of Sigourney and the Green Knight directed by David Lowry that came out this year. On one hand, the reading of the poem the film gives is deeply conventional, it is almost pointedly bland in its approach to Gawain's mediocrity and the film's thinking about sacrifice. This is to say that the reading of the poem, the film seems to, in its reading of the poem, the film seems to be loyal to its source material with one major structural departure that I'll describe in a second. On the other hand, in its casting of the Indian British actor Dev Patel in its role of Sir Gawain and its shifting of the narrative emphasis on lineage and succession, the film stages a version of the negotiation that Allen's book frames, asking viewers to reckon with a post-colonial Britain beyond the language of internal strangers and to con that continually denies or holds at a distance Britons who are re read as eternally other. This is not the facile dream of a post-racial Britain, but an evacuation of the treasured ethnic myths to be replaced by a more complicated reality of a Britain locked in a struggle with itself over the reality of a Britain that is a result of its imperial past. Not only does the film censure on the uncertainty Gawain feels about taking the throne after Arthur, the film has an extended sequence in which Gawain imagines his rule after Arthur, one that ends poorly because he's unwilling to do his ties to courtly power and court norms that the girdle signifies. Upon waking from this reverie, he undoes the girdle and the Green Knight playfully says, now off with your head. And this, this is the film's one ambitious step outside of the confines of the poem, and it is a telling one in that it plays out the future of a multi-ethnic Britain, including the birth of Gawain's child. So I can't help but recall the ground clearing argument that Alan makes with respect to the end of the poem. I, I'll quote it at length. The poem's conclusion offers a fantasy of political compromise beyond a horizontal ceremonial unity. The wearing of the green girdle by the whole court, while nonetheless bypassing the question of royal decision, the girdle identifies shared aristocratic distinction, the court symbolic power as a class, by displaying hospitality, generosity, and tolerance. The king's power is not gone, rather the scene plays down or hides the way in which the court hierarchy depends on a shared recognition of the king as a locus of the power at the potential cost of the knights. As Bardieu writes, the language of authority never governs without the collaboration of those it governs, without the help of the social mechanisms capable of producing their complicity the court now complies the language of governance. So once again, move this reading into a new situation. I think that Alan points us towards an elegant reading of the film. The film, I would argue, is offering us a way to see past the ambivalence and melancholy at the end of the poem, its longing for the days of the bliss in Arthur's court, 
and a way past the incongruous modern crisis of British polity by offering us a speculative future that is impossible to imagine. We never get to see uh, what, is what this liberated Gawain might do, but that's precisely the point. We're no longer stuck in the puns and ambivalences. It's resolved negotiations of, it's unresolved negotiations of courtly power. And rather we are in a rich space of hiatus or in an uncertain refuge of a tolerant, hospitable future. So thank you for this wonderful book. And thank you for that. And um, I'd like to thank all four speakers so far um, who've given brilliant presentations and are brilliant people. Um, they're, Comments so far speak to the power and depth of, of this book, too. Um, so I, I'd like to in, invite, if she's willing, um, Elizabeth uh, right now to either bond or to, to reflect on the say. Thank you, everybody, for such various and kind and generous comments um, on, on this. Um, on this project, um, I'm gonna, I, I kind of wanna start um, with the end and, and um, uh, I'll admit that my, my understanding of The Green Knight, the film um, is a little clouded by having found it, um, having found it um, both interesting to think about and increasingly annoying <laughs> in its lack of, in its lack of um, attentiveness to what I think the poem is really deeply concerned with, which is that that sense of um, well, you described it in in sort of melancholy terms, Matthew. Um, but that's that sense of Camelot's kind of um, um, gorgeousness and meaningfulness, its ability to create um, a kind of uh, social order that is not just surface. Um, but I think that the film is really not interested in that at all. And, and that's, which is, should be fine in, in theory, um, but in practice, as I think it through, I, um, I find myself missing that piece. Um, in any event, um, I do agree with you though, that that's, that the, the film is kind of trying to imagine it, uh, imagine a speculative future, as you, as you put it, um, trying to speculate about a future that we can't quite imagine. Um, and, uh, or that it can't quite imagine maybe. Um, um, and I think that's, um, uh, you know, a, a future that is in fact, not the poem that's, that's supposed to not be the poem. <laughs> when you make a movie of the poem, you do something different. Um, um, I was also struck, Matthew, in your comments by the um, the attention to the Haitian Roundup, uh, as it were. Um, and I, uh, I kind of, I think that the the process of writing this book took me from a kind of initial. Uh, almost idealization of sanctuary as um, as real refuge, as as um, kind of a fascination with the way that you could create a sanctuary that really could sort of keep you safe from prosecution or from vengeance um, in the earlier Middle Ages, especially. Um, and as I looked at, at sanctuary more and more, I just it the the sort of impermeability of those boundaries never really um, was never fully convincing and the, and as I've um, as I've continued thinking about it after the book's publication, sanctuary starts to seem at least in some circumstances um, starts to seem like a mystification, not just a fantasy of what we could achieve if we uh, crossed this boundary into safety, but in fact, a kind of um, cover up <laughs> in a way of what say America thinks it can offer. Um, and I do think that that's not always true. I think that sanctuary is, is elastic and that sometimes 
it does offer mere survival and that mere survival is a big thing. Um, I'm actually, I learned that from Bill Jordan, who's here in the, uh, in the, the little square. Um, and I think that's exactly right. Um, and it, it, um, it matters very much at times that people simply survive, that human beings don't die, but survive. Um, on the other hand, to survive in the way that, um, that um, detention and deportation um, imply is, is something else again. Um, and I think that that sense that sanctuary can be used to mystify or to cover over suffering um, is, is something that um, makes it uh, also, uh, I think somebody else, I can't remember if it was um, Kathy maybe, uh, uh, or, or Jen said that it was a, a sort of half measure. Um, and it is uh, um, a half measure if you think about um, modern uh, um, um, immigrants in, act in churches, um, sanctuary can be very much a half measure. It's a temporary thing that is designed to keep people from being deported for a little while. Uh, it worked at its best in the 1980s, um, when it could lead to people actually gaining citizenship. Um, nowadays, it takes a, a lot longer. People are in sanctuary for you know, a year and a half to two years to three years. And sometimes they don't end up gaining citizenship so easily. Um, and then that looks a lot more like detention. Um, and it looks a lot more like an imprisonment. I think we're, we're all kind of very familiar with that line between um, safety and imprisonment from the quarantine um, because that because quarantine walks that same line it keeps you safe but it also keeps you isolated and and imprisoned um, it restricts you um, anyway um, I I really appreciate um, the different kind of strands of this conversation Jen's um, pulling out the necessity of survival and also the, the sort of um, the structural deferral um, that enables, um, that allows uh, the law to affirm itself by sort of building in exceptions to itself as it were. Um, so you get uh, uh, an empowerment of a, of a king in particular um, by his seeding of a certain power um, in allowing sanctuary. Um, and that's a sort of an important strand to me politically too, because now, so in the middle ages, the king is responsible for sanctuary and allows it, um, at least notionally. Um, and, but now the state arrays itself, at least in America, very much against sanctuary. Sanctuary is something that's more a matter of civil disobedience or, um, um, or legal, uh, legal, um, it's, it's illegal, right? <laughs> it's not written into the law in the same way that it was. Um, and so I think that's, that's something that is kind of uh, crucially important to the difference between now and then. Um, and, um, and Kathy, I was really appreciative of your um, way of mapping the sacred and secular, which is so importantly also different in the Middle Ages from now. Um, but I, I guess I would like to say that um, that, that, that dyadic um, combination of sacred and secular or that Venn diagram where there's some overlap remains interesting now as well. It's, it's characteristic, more characteristic, more obvious for the Middle Ages, but I don't think that there's not overlap now, um, even though we tend to think that there's just an opposition between the sacred and the secular. Um, for example, the way that sanctuary has been secularized and become something that applies to sanctuary cities or sanctuary universities. Um, but to call a city or a university sanctuary kind of drags along with it some aspect of that sacralization that has always been available to the concept. Um, and I think it would be worth our thinking about that. I think it would be worth our thinking a little bit more fully 
about left-wing forms of Christianity in this country that, that do make uses of sanctuary um, in politically uh, effective, if half-measured ways. Um, because the, the way that the right wing has taken over the discourses of, um, of religion um, are, have been very deeply damaging. Um, so that's kind of the, um, that's my soapbox about that um, particular um, topic. Um, Karma, your reading of, of Sir Gowan and the Green Knight makes me think all kinds of new thoughts. Thank you. Um, I love the Fablio um, analogy. I think that's um, also really, uh, it, it, it just turns the perspective a little bit for me. Um, and I agree with you on Arthur as providing hospitality light. I think that's, that's right uh, also. Um, so thank you, um, thank you very much. I, I, I still do think that, um, well, I think that sanctuary is a, is a kind of um, species, a specific form of, of hospitality. Um, and so in as much as the poem is a representation of hospitality's dark side, it is also a representation of, of sanctuary's dark side. Um, it's, its ability to offer itself, but not necessarily complete the offer of, of safety. Um, so. Thank you so much, all of you, for your um, generous and um, thought-provoking engagement with the book. I, I really, really appreciate it. All right, thank you. Um, we have some time for questions. Hi, um, so this, is, this was really wonderful. I apologize, I came in a few minutes late because a perfect storm of things uh, that were supposed to happen earlier just happened in my house <laughs> at the same time. So I'm sorry if I missed, um, if I miss something and this question isn't as um, useful as it could be. Uh, it really, I was excited about this book and now I'm more excited and I enjoyed everything. So, but I do have a, a question and that question is about um, asylum and the relationship between sanctuary and asylum um, in the middle ages and mid middle English, um, but also today, right? I mean, uh, and, and, you know, I guess I'll just, if I have a second, say a little bit of where this is coming from. I mean, I grew up in the 80s and 90s uh, in Ohio in uh, a house where a lot of Lebanese refugees uh, were. <laughs> they were my family. Um, and there was a civil war. And they were seeking one in particular, asylum, um, which is not exactly the same thing as sanctuary. Um, anyway. I, I'm just going to leave it there, but it's just, it's really interesting to me because I sort of went from, from there and thinking about that and being a child in, in that place of hope for asylum. I mean, not for me, I was born here as my father was, but um, then to college, uh, to Michigan, where Sir Gawain and the Green Knight meant everything to me. And there are just so many things coming together here. Um, and I wonder if asylum matters and how it matters to you. And I can't wait to read the book. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Susie. I, I don't know how to answer that question very well, <laughs> I'll say. Um, and I'm so um, um, pleased that you could be here. Thank you for, for coming. Um, I, I guess I would say, you know, originally, you know, etymologically, asylum is sort of um, non-violation, right? It's a, it's a word that means that means you can't steal things from a temple. Um, and um, in that sense, it's, um, it's, in a way it's hopes are higher than sanctuary, right? It's a, and especially in the situation you're referring to in the modern period, you're, you're thinking about a, a hope for asylum, which is a permanent sort of safety in the US. Um, from, from wars elsewhere. And that particular um, use of asylum does overlap a lot with the sanctuary movement at that time in the 1980s, um, which was essentially a, a kind of sheltering of people who were looking for asylum, um, right? So they, they do overlap. In, in uh, I guess in the Middle Ages, I, 
um, I'm, the, the word, uh, I haven't dealt with the word that much. The, you know, the sort of the conceptual difference there um, hasn't really been, um, I'm trying to think of, a, of an instance when it, when it comes to the floor. So I don't have a good answer to that, that distinction. Um, for, for the Middle Ages. I guess I would say there, the, even the word sanctuary doesn't get used um, always um, to indicate even the kind of church sanctuary that, that I'm talking about. You know, so 40 days of, a, of, of church sanctuary, that's usually or very often just called fleeing to the church. Um, and so there's, there, there is a kind of, um, I think there's a sort of, sacralization there with the sanctuary, um, the term sanctuary in particular, um, that isn't as uh, heightened in our use of the word now of uh, the word asylum. Um, I can't say whether that would be the case for the Middle Ages or not. I would have to look. What if you could talk briefly about um, how refugee camps factor into this um, story? Are they an extension of the logic of sanctuary? Um, are they different from it? They're not precisely a, a zone of, ex, of exception. Um, uh, they tend to be maintained by, by church groups, church missions. Are they in any sense a kind of sacred space? Uh, they're very often liminal yet permanent. That's really, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think the, um, to me in, in this book, the <laughs> sacred, of the space was important, was um, kind of uh, not only uh, a sort of definitional um, kind of, it, it was, it, it's important definitionally um, to sort of saying what sanctuary means um, for the Middle Ages, but it's also, I think um, it helps us see ways that modern uses of the the word sanctuary or of ideas of refuge um, do retain a kind of sacred element. Um, I'm not sure whether you could, you definitely can't say that of all uses of the term refuge. <laughs> and you can't say it necessarily of um, say asylum seeking. Um, I think sometimes that does carry a sacral, um, a sacral element in as much as there's a kind of, um, uh, kind of fantasy of America as providing a sacred refuge itself. Um, whether you could say that about deportation camps is maybe another kind of question like that. It, uh, and I haven't been to one. Um, I've only read about them, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't often creep into that vocabulary because the conditions there um, tend to be the thing that's emphasized, right? So it's a place of suffering and a place of kind of just barely survival, but without the imprimatur, I want to say, or the sort of mystification um, of, of a sacred kind of symbolism. Um, someone could probably um, give me more detail there, like maybe you, Vance, um, but I think it's not it's not necessarily the case that someone that, that that human suffering is made meaningful in this. Um, it, well, to say it really broadly, in general, wherever people are suffering, it is not necessarily meaningful. Sanctuary, in my view, is a way of making it meaningful, but I'm not sure deportation camps partake in that. Um, always. Sometimes, yes, I'm sure, but not always and not necessarily. Well, I have to make this the last question, though, in advance. I invite people to stay on after the formal part is over. But, um, and, and, and Andrea, hi, by the way. <clears throat> hi. Uh, hi, Vance. Hi, everyone. Uh, congratulations, Elizabeth. This is so exciting. And it's just so wonderful to see everyone together celebrating a book. And hopefully we can all celebrate together uh, sometime soon. Um, I haven't read the book yet, and I'm really, really excited to read it. And what I was just thinking about, and this comes off of Susie's question a little bit, is 
recently I was reading, <clears throat> I've been doing a lot of reading in museum culture and collecting culture and sort of early modernist ideas about the formation of museums. And there was an active vocalized complaint that certain objects were not given asylum in museums, certain kinds of objects. Huh. Um, and the, the complaint was that it is sort of imperial aristocratic objects that are funneled into, you know, funneled out of <clears throat> private collections um, and private royal collections. And those are the founding of our museums, you know. So obviously there's a long post-colonial, uh, you know, uh, history going on there. But it made me wonder about the question of objects in your research, are, have you come across examples of objects um, being given that kind of protective sanctuary? Are there any, hmm. any roles for objects versus sort of sentient beings um, in that particular kind of energy of protection um, and that that sort of in the middle um, experience that that you've been talking about? <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting question. Um, I haven't um, given it a, a whole lot of thought. I, I, I do talk a lot about animals, <laughs> um, especially in the first chapter, um, but later too. Um, I, I guess, I, you know, what comes to mind is like the sword in the stone or some such thing, you know, where, where objects await their, their futures. Um, uh, or um, I'm trying to think, you know, a, a there's um, there are certainly there's certainly the Grail right, which has a sort of sort of you, you know there's a, a an imperative to protect and to and at, at once to protect and to seek um, that object. Um, and these are not exactly museum pieces, but but they are they do have a little bit of that quality of um, sort of. Uh, being being kept safe for some other use, some different um, role in the world that is that is not just sort of ordinary instrumental use, um, and that sort of makes their time frame a little bit different. Um, yeah, those are those are the things that come to mind. I mean, I guess there are sacred objects, there are relics, for example, that are similarly kept. Um, and a, I, su I suppose you could think about a reliquary as a as a kind of sanctuary um, mm -hmm. for for a, a body or a body part or a a, um, a, a piece a, a thing an object. Um, but you, um, I guess I that's a little different to me from um, from the way that that sanctuary preserves life. Um, and the sort of animation of the of the body seems important there. So I'm not sure quite where you know where I would end up thinking of it, thinking of it that way. But that's a really neat it's a neat question and, and neat to think about. Thanks. Well, so I want to thank Van Smith for an amazing job as our moderator. I want to thank our incredible group of panelists, and of course, I want to thank Elizabeth herself for allowing us to give her some attention and time and some allow this incredible project to breathe and be shared in this way. It's been so illuminating.